Welcome back to the first episode of Coffee, Crime, and Crafts for 2021. Um, today, we are going to be discussing the Christmas death of Kenneth James Purcell. He was a 62-year-old taxi cab driver from Halifax, Nova Scotia, who was unfortunately stabbed to death in the early morning hours on Christmas Day. 2005. So after Christmas break, um, I had actually anticipated posting my first video um, for 2021 on New Year's Day. Unfortunately, um, I received a call that morning advising that one of my former co-workers had lost her battle with PTSD. Um, she had gone missing on New Year's Eve and she was located um, in the very early morning hours on Christmas, or sorry, on New Year's Day. So um, Valerie had retired a few years ago, um, so she didn't have to deal with our day-to-day -day job of dispatching anymore. But retiring, unfortunately, doesn't really give you respite from your mental health. And uh, her PTSD, I guess, um, she couldn't leave that behind as easily as she left the job a couple years ago. So um, it was a rough couple of weeks, but now everything is kind of getting back to normal and it's time for me to get a new video up. So I do a lot of crafting, as you all know, most of which involves some form of needle or fiber <laughs> work. Um, it's either cross stitch or embroidery, hand sewing, knitting, crochet. I find all of these crafts serve as a really great stress reliever for me. And the rhythm of doing a, rep a repetitive task with my hands um, seems to have some sort of lovely calming effect on my mind. So I think that's why I'm so drawn to them. Today I'm going to be working on this piece, which is a piece um, charted and created by Long Dog Samplers. It is called Death by Cross Stitch. It's um, one of the nice pieces of this project is that I am stitching it in one single color. I'm using DMC 939, which sometimes does show up um, black on the camera, but it's actually a really, really dark navy blue. So, um, today I'm going to be working on this. Don't have to worry about changing colors on the project, and I've got several lengths of floss pre-cut. So I'm just going to put this on my frame, and I'm going to start working on some fill-in in this particular section here. So for those of you wondering, um, I'm stitching this using one strand of floss over one square of fabric. Um, see if I can zoom in on this a little bit for you. There we go, let's try that. And I actually start with a pin stitch when I do this, so I bring my thread down in the center of my square and I come up in the bottom left corner. I leave a little tail sticking out here on top. Down through the center here. Up through the top right corner down through the center again. Oops, I'm not doing a very good job of keeping this in frame for you, am I? Let's 
because I'm trying to use two hands at the one time here. Then this little tail that's left on top, I literally snip that off right down close to the fabric. And now that is anchored and it acts as the first leg of my stitch. Then I can go ahead and finish my X and keep going. And my thread is anchored. So now I have to move my lamp because you guys are getting a really bad shadow there. So there we go, that's a little bit better. Without further chatter, um, let's get into this week's crime. About 7.45 a.m. on Christmas Day, 2005, uh, Kenneth James Purcell was driving his taxi cab when he was dispatched to the Needs Convenience Store on Highland Park Drive. I think that was in Dartmouth. He was to pick up a fare and drive him to an apartment block located at 14 Churchill Court. At 8.10, Mr. Purcell radioed into his uh, dispatcher for help. He said over the radio that he had been stabbed 11 times in the chest by his male passenger, but that he had managed to drive from the scene of the attack. The taxi dispatcher advised Ken to pull over at the Shibukto Ford auto dealership and wait for police and an ambulance. And the dispatcher then immediately dialed 911. At about 8.15, Ken was found in his car in the parking lot of a red building right next door to the dealership on the corner of Raymore Drive and Main Street in Dartmouth. He was rushed to hospital and was pronounced dead at Queen Elizabeth II Health Science Center in Halifax. Mr. Purcell had been an oil rig worker back in the 1970s, but he had quit his job uh, when his fear of water kept him um, from completing a newly mandated uh, survival training course they had to do. So he sold taxi dispatch radios for the Marconi company for a while before finally becoming a taxi driver himself. He had nearly 30 years of driving experience, and at the time of his death, he was working for Bob's and Bluebell Taxi. He had three grown children. Two of his daughters were living in Edmonton at the time, caring for his uh, former wife. And he also had a son that was living in Ontario. Ken had offered to work Christmas morning. Um, that was just, you know, the type of person that he was. He offered to do the Christmas morning shift um, because it would give other younger drivers the opportunity to spend time with their families. And as well, he could also make a little extra money and tips during the holidays. The owner of the cab company was a Mr. Calvin DeMont. Um, he described Ken as being a perfect person who would never say anything bad about anyone. He would try to avoid an argument uh, at all costs, and DeMont said that he was sure if there had been some sort of altercation and that the fellow had demanded money, Ken probably would have handed it over. So police arrived on the scene 
Oops, there we go. Police arrived on the scene and began to investigate. They cordoned off three small areas in the Dartmouth neighborhood with police tape. There were a handful of police vehicles, including a forensic identification unit, as well as a mobile command unit, parked along Raymore Drive. They extensively examined the black, sorry, they extensively examined the Buick LeSabre Ken had been driving, taking numerous photographs and marking potential evidence with yellow tags. By the following day on December 26th, which is the Boxing Day holiday here in Canada, police released to the public that they had arrested a 17-year-old, a 17-year-old male, in relation to the stabbing. He was sent to attend court on Wednesday, December 28th, and at that time, he would be formally charged. Now, at the time, uh, the male suspect's name was withheld under the um, Canadian Youth Criminal Justice Act. He was being detained at a young offender facility until his court appearance, and that's because he was under the age of 18 at the time that this crime occurred. Now, once they got in court, this young male was formally charged with second degree murder. And the Crown Attorney, Frank Hoskins, said he planned to seek an adult sentence, which would lead to tougher penalties if the youth had been found guilty. The same youth had previously been convicted of an aggravated assault uh, on September 6th of 2002, when he was just 14 years old. At that time, during a holdup attempt, the boy stabbed another Halifax cab driver in the chest with a steak knife. He was sentenced to 18 months in jail and a year's probation um, as a youth and the cab driver uh, at that time recovered and returned to work driving a, a taxi. The suspect's mother said that he had been arrested about six times since the summer um, in 2005 um, for carrying drugs or weapons. In November of that year, he pled guilty to making death threats against his mother and his stepfather. Despite his mother's written request, asking that he be held in jail or treated in hospital, he was actually released um, to await a sentencing hearing that had been set for February. And it was while he was released and while awaiting that hearing that he committed this um, second stabbing. At this time, um, the unfortunate victim was Ken Purcell. And as already stated, he um, unfortunately did not survive. So the suspect's mother was quoted um, in an article I saw saying, My husband and I have been in the courts for quite some time, all summer long, trying to get them to hold my son. Oops, my thread just slipped out. To hold my son and to even give him some kind of psychiatric evaluation, she said. Our pleas didn't mean anything. It seems as if our Youth Criminal Justice Act protects criminals more than it protects the rest of us in society. So I'm actually at the end of that thread, so I'm just going to flip my work over here and 
I always tie off my work on this piece by just running my thread through the back of a few stitches here, like so. There we go. And I can just snip that off now and start a new thread and go on our merry way. Okay, here we go. All back here. So let's carry on with our story of Mr. Purcell here. So in relation to his mom um, saying that about the youth justice system and the fact that she was trying to get him some help, um, thinking that surely he must have some sort of um, mental instability or mental health issue. She said that at one point a doctor had actually found um, a treatment option, um, but her son didn't want to take it, and by law he couldn't be forced to do so. He had to be willing to go on his own. Whoops, just hit my camera mount there. I did it again. Goodness gracious. So in court at a pre-sentence hearing for previous crimes uh, that the youth was found guilty of, a psychiatric report was presented stating that the accused did not suffer from any psychosis hallucinations, or delusions, that he is callous, intimidating, deceptive, manipulative, and extremely angry. He seemed to show very little remorse over the previous 10 crimes that he had been um, accused of, including several breaches of conditions as well as a break and enter into an ex-girlfriend's home and an assault against um, the mother of his child. Also, a significant case involving the threatening, um, threatening to kill his mother and his stepfather. So the Crown Attorney, Terry Nickerson, said the psychiatric um, assessment that he read was one of the most negative he's seen. It portrayed a young man with very little remorse who only seems sorry for his crimes once he's been caught. In May of 2006, so that would be almost a year and a half after um, the killing. So in May of 2006, Ken Purcell's killer was convicted in adult court of second degree murder. It appeared there had been some dispute over the cab fare and when the teen became irate, um, he just lashed out and attacked Mr. Purcell. The medical examiner determined that the victim had actually suffered between 14 and 16 stab wounds. In August of 2007, he was sentenced to life in prison, and that's adult prison, with no possibility of parole for seven years. He was sentenced as an adult because the trial judge felt a youth sentence would not be sufficient to hold him accountable or to give him the treatment that he would need. Even though he was sentenced as an adult, um, the court still ordered that um, a publication ban 
publication ban uh, remain in place on the killer's name, applying the Youth Criminal Justice Act regulations, as he was only 17 years old when the crime occurred. Um, the judge also said that that ban would stay in place until the 30-day appeal period had passed. In September of 2007, the publication ban was lifted and the killer was now identified as 19-year-old Garmin Davison Smith. He did attempt to have this ruling overturned by the Supreme Court of Canada, but the court refused to hear the case. Uh, Garmin Smith remained incarcerated and has actually spent his entire adult life in prison, with the exception of some brief unescorted passes. In 2017, he was transferred to a higher security prison because he was threatening other inmates. Uh, by 2018, he was granted... Um, shockingly, six 72-hour unescorted passes to be taken over the year in an effort to help him reintegrate and prepare for his eventual return to society. It was felt that he could take part in some programs that were offered outside of prison. Um, by 2019, he applied for day parole, but that was denied. The parole board found he remained an, unaccept, uh, an unacceptably high risk um, to reoffend in a violent manner. And that given his violent history and the amount of time that he had spent incarcerated, his reintegration to the community had to be gradual and very closely supervised. So he was ordered to spend more time um, behind bars. In 2020, so just this past year, he again requested an in-prison parole hearing Sorry, not an in-prison, an in-person. He wanted to have an in-person parole hearing, but it was denied due to uh, COVID-19 regulations. Um, they weren't doing anything in person. He was requesting at that time a two-month release from prison to aid in his personal development. And again, that was denied. The parole board found that emotional stability was crucial um, and that he must be able to demonstrate it with consistency across different settings and situations. But he was still much too unpredictable. And some of the programs that he had been participating in had also been disrupted due to the pandemic um, and they weren't going forward. So at this point, uh, Smith still remains in prison for this crime. And um, it's not known when he'll ever uh, qualify for parole. And it does seem unfortunate that obviously he was quite a troubled youth. There had to have been something going on that made him um, violent in the way that he is. But um, he's never really taken any responsibility or shown any true remorse for the crimes that he's com committed while he's um, was both free as a youth or in incarcerated as an inmate.
So I know this crime was a little bit different. Um, I basically had chosen this one because it was something that happened in Atlantic Canada and um, it had occurred on Christmas Day, which um, just makes it all the, you know, all the worse for the time of year and the age with which this um, criminal was when he committed the crime. I hope you've managed to get some crafting time in while listening to my episode this week. I've managed to get the start of a section here done, which isn't too bad. So I hope you'll join me next week. I have another crime picked out that is a little bit different. Um, I think I'm going to be talking about the Grand Manan Five. Um, it's a story about, I guess, an incident of vigilante justice that occurred on Grand Manan Island, um, which is located just off the coast of New Brunswick. It's an interesting um, story, a um, little bit odd in nature. Um, I thought that might be a little bit entertaining. And then I have a couple of more high-profile crimes that I'm going to talk about in subsequent episodes coming up uh, later in January and going into February. I will be back next week with a regular floss tube update. Um, I may actually post it um, early in the week. We'll see how that goes. I'm still working um, shifts two days and two nights at work for the time being. So I hope you managed to get some crafting in while you were listening to this week's episode. Uh, please give the video a like and feel free to subscribe to my channel so you'll see any upcoming content that I have. I've also included a link down below in the description box for the Buy Me A Coffee site. Um, not certainly not necessary, but a coffee is always appreciated and it helps support my channel and the research that I put into these episodes. Thanks for joining me. And I'll see you again in a couple of weeks. Uh -huh.